in animal like protists there are many groups so one group we will discuss each group will go one by one uh, so let us look at uh, animal like protista first and one first group is called zooflagellates Again, this classification is based on their locomotory structures. Based on the locomotory structures, animal-like protists are divided into separate groups. One group is called as zooflagellate. Sometimes they call it as mastigophora. Zoo mastigophora. So uh, these animals, you know, if you look at it, as the name indicates, right? They have flagella. And they are heterotrophs, which means they uh, they have this holozoic type of nutrition. And the best example for zooflagellate is I'm sure you would have heard about this organism called Trypanosoma. Trypanosoma gambiens. So this is known as uh, you know causes uh, a fever, which is actually called you know sleeping sickness. Very commonly heard in African countries, sleeping sickness. And uh, what they have found, this Trypanosoma gambians, you can see there, you know, in the picture, the second one, which is, you know, having a flagellum and all the in between the RBC. So, that is actually Trypanosoma. So, what it does is, it causes a kind of coma, you know, because of the reason, the sickness is called sleeping sickness. Sometimes they call it as gambian fever. And this Trypanosoma, is transmitted via a fly which is known as sitsi fly. So, this fly transmits this uh, sleeping sickness. So, then you have different uh, species of trypanosoma. We just spoke about trypanosoma gambians, but there is one more which is known as trypanosoma cruzi, which causes another disease called Chagas disease. Then there is one disease which is uh, very popularly heard. It is known as Kala Azar. You know that disease is also caused by a zooflagellate and it is called Leishmania. So Leishmania causes Kala Azar or something called Leishmania. And apart from that there is one more. You can see here, uh, you know that is uh, looks very different. So this is called as Giardia. So this one, it actually causes something called giardiasis. It lives in the intestinal tract of uh, human beings and it causes severe diarrhea and all that. So it is a zooflagellate. And there is one interesting zooflagellate which I would like you to see. That is actually called trichonympha. If you look at this, this one, it lives not in human beings but it lives in termites, inside the body of termites. Why? You know termites, the white ants which actually eat wood and when they eat wood, you think, uh, you know, these uh, white ants or the termites digest wood, definitely they cannot because they don't have that enzyme called cellulase which will digest all that wood and everything. But what they do is they harbor the trichonympha in their body. So trichonympha is capable of absorbing uh, or digesting the cellulose, right? So it helps the uh, it's a symbiotic association between trichonympha and termites where they uh, actually benefit mutually. So, this is one example of, uh, you know, animal-like protists, especially a zoo flagellate. And then, let, let us talk about another group of animals which are known as euglenoids. Initially, euglenoids were under a plant-like protist, uh, but then they uh, found out that most of these uh, euglenoids, euglena is a very good example, uh, they actually, one third of them only have chloroplast. That means they are photosynthetic. Rest of the euglenoids are uh, heterotrophic, which means they live like animals, right? Animal like protists. So they did not know whether they, they should keep it in plant like protist or animal like protist, but now they have given them a separate group called euglenoids, okay? So euglenoids, the best example is euglena. So if you look at the structure of euglena, I have it over here. So you can see that it has a lot of chloroplasts and it has an eye spot. This is a autotrophic euglena. 
right so it has a chloroplast it has an eye spot eye spot helps it to detect the light so that it can move towards light because it needs that to photosynthesize and then uh, it has uh, you know contractile vacuole you know contractile vacuoles help to uh, for osmoregulation regulation of water content and it has one large flagellum and a very small flagellum and you know it has a apart from the cell membrane it has a covering which is known as pellicle this pellicle is a proteinaceous sheath which is found above the cell membrane it gives them a kind of flexibility to change their shape right so this is called as pellicle a proteinaceous sheath which is found in euglena and euglena also divide by transverse uh, euglena also divides by binary fission which is longitudinal correct and apart from that let us also talk about other group of uh, animal like protists the third group is actually amoeboids okay so as you all know amoeba is one of the first it belongs to protozoa they call it as protozoans means first animal uh, right so uh, this is a structure of uh, amoeba and you know what is the movement amoeba moves by pseudopodia so they have pseudopodia so you can see that they will phagocytose uh, the food and they have contractile vacuole cell membrane though they don't have a pellicle they have just a cell membrane which is very very flexible so they change their shape there is no specific shape of amoeba so there is a group of amoeba which is also known as i am sure you would have heard about this it's called entamoeba so this is actually called entamoeba histolytica it lives again uh, on the, you know on the inside the human digestive tract and the most common form of amoebic dysentery you know it is caused by entamoeba histolytica so apart from amoeba there are certain you know amoeba don't have any shell or any hard substance outside but in in uh, amoeboids there are group of organisms group of amoebas which had developed hard shell over them they are basically called as uh, you know foraminiferans as you will see in the slide so what is the uh, foraminiferans so uh, foraminiferans are actually uh, made up of they are again found in the sea they are belong to this zooplankton uh, and you know you will see that um, in foraminiferans they have a hard shell which is beautifully sculpted and it has lot of pores in it from the pores you know lot of uh, pseudopodia project so it looks as you can see in the picture like sun rays coming out they are nothing but the pseudopodia projecting out and the shell is made up of calcium uh, carbonate that is the shell which is made up of in fact uh, they uh, they accumulate you know dead foraminiferans accumulate and they form cliffs which are known as white cliffs as you can see next so uh, it is responsible for the formation of white cliffs correct and also other group of uh, uh, you know amoeboids are called as radiolarians so radiolarians is actually they are made up of uh, uh, the shell is not made of calcium carbonate more of silica based shell and they are also having pseudopodia which will uh, which actually project out from the shell not from inside so radiolarians are also abundant on the uh, in the sea so this foraminiferans and radiolarians deposit their dead bodies get deposited the dead shells get deposited and you know they are used as when the people look for oil deposits in the sea actually this uh, deposits of uh, foraminiferans and radiolarians tell them that is a place where you can find oil so there are indicators that oil deposits are there might be there around that because they never get uh, you know over years together they get piled up there without getting destroyed so this is the uh, importance of foraminiferans and radiolarians one is they will form white cliffs and they are indicators of oil deposits in the ocean and they are the major uh, uh, planktonic organisms right and apart from that we'll also look for another group of uh, 
animal like protists which are known as ciliates as the name indicates the organ of locomotion here is cilia right so they have uh, many cilia for example the best example you all know is paramecium paramecium slipper shaped animal cule they call it as it looks like a slipper so this one no paramecium is uh, the that's the cell which shows highest degree of specialization if you look at this it has two nuclei one is called bigger nucleus called macronucleus then it has a smaller nucleus called micronucleus so micronucleus helps in reproduction whereas macronucleus is mainly meant for other uh, characters vegetative characters and then it has a cell mouth you can see that and it has a buccal uh, cavity kind of thing right the cell mouth is called cytostome where the food actually enters only through that okay and then uh, once it enters uh, there there is a beautiful contractile vacuole there can you see that so the contractile vacuole keeps roaming and uh, it keeps uh, uh, helps the organism to regulate uh, osmotic pressure so uh, apart from that Uh, it also has pellicle which will make it flexible and then it has a also has a cell anal pore through which or it's called cytopyge through which you know the food goes out so this one shows highest degree and you will see that inside the uh, paramecia they have a group uh, small small uh, you know things called trichocysts are found trichocysts so uh, whenever the paramecium is agitated this trichosis are like you know small like this so they just open up and release one thread which might have uh, some kind of barbs or you know sticky things uh, sticky barbs at the end so what happens whenever they uh, they feel irritated or when they are attacked by by any other organism they immediately release this uh, you know uh, trichosis which open and Uh, release the thread and the thread will go and uh, it will uh, uh, certain times these barbs also will have poison right so they will actually kill the other organ helps to kill so it is trichosis are main organs of defense and also for capturing prey because it will bind the prey and you know it will kill the prey so both ways it is useful the trichosis and ciliates uh, example paramecium it uh, normally divides by uh transverse binary fission which means if this is the organism it it divides like this so that's called transverse binary fission and paramecia are well known because they are also capable of sexual reproduction the sexual reproduction in paramecium happens through a process known as conjugation so this is the process uh, which happens in paramecium so you can look at it this is the highest degree of uh, specialization shown by a single cell a cell has so many things inside correct so much specialization inside so there is one ciliate which is even more complex than this it's called stentor that is one of the ciliate highest degree of complexity shown by that right so these are all uh, you know animal like and also there is one more animal like protist which is also known as sporozoans okay that is the name given to the, that group sporozoans so what are these sporozoans i'm sure you would have heard about uh, malaria right so people get uh, the fever fever with chills that is called malaria and uh, the causative organism for malaria belong to sporozoa interestingly sporozoans have no organs for locomotion until now we have seen ciliates flagellates amoeboids they all have a locomotor structures but sporozoa have none so they are uh, actually non motile and all of the sporozoans are parasites there is no sporozoan which is free living all of them are parasites which means they live on some organism or the other so the, let us talk about one popular plasmodium plasmodium is a sporozoan so uh, which will actually cause the disease malaria there are many different malaria 
diseases caused by different organisms. There is something called Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium falciparum, and Plasmodium, uh, you know, ovale, like that. So let us now talk about in general the life history of Plasmodium. It involves two hosts. Okay, Plasmodium involves two hosts. The one host is called, uh, I mean, we human beings. The other one is called the female Anopheles mosquito. So, female Anopheles mosquito acts as, acts as the primary host. So, what decides whether the host is primary or secondary? If the sexual reproduction or happens inside the host, then that host is called primary. Since the sexual reproduction happens inside the female Anopheles mosquito, this is considered as a primary host and man is considered as a secondary host. And uh, But it, majority of the time it spends only in man. And if you look at it, uh, you know, when the mosquito which is infected uh, actually bites a human being, what happens is, it uh, through the saliva, the, these uh, plasmodia enter in the form of sporozoids, they are called as sporozoids. So, they enter into the uh, blood and from the blood they reach liver. Liver is the place where they get stored and they get divided to form many more uh, plasmodia, right? So, as it goes uh, there uh, in the hepatic cell, the liver cell is called hepatic cell. So, there the, it divides and then it gets converted to something called as merozoid. So, these merozoids now enter the bloodstream and they enter into RBC, erythrocyte. Once they enter into the RBC, they become something called tropozoids. So, what are tropozoids? Tropozoids are nothing but feeding. So, they keep feeding and they become bigger and bigger inside the uh, RBC. And once they become big enough, it turns into a schizont. Please understand, schizont means it is ready to divide. It has produced uh, schizogony. They call it as, the division is called schizogony. Schizogony means they divide and they form many, many uh, spores, right? So, that is called as schizogony. So, this has become schizont which means it is ready to divide, it divides and it produces uh, a lot of other cells which actually rub, uh, they turn into something called gametocytes, right? So, these gametocytes will be released when the erythrocyte is ruptured. So, along with these gametocytes, you will also see some of the hemozoin granules are released. So, the, they are toxins. These hemozoin granules actually cause the chillness associated with malaria. Now, these gametocytes, what do they do? They enter into peripheral blood circulation. So that whenever a fresh mosquito bites the same man, these gametocytes, both male and female, will enter through the saliva. Then they turn into gametes and they fuse to form a zygote. This zygote in the mosquito midgut, it will remain in the midgut where it turns into oocyst later and then inside that oocyst sporozoids develop. Now once they develop this uh, oocyst will burst, release all the sporozoids and they enter into the salivary gland and remain there so that whenever the mosquito goes and attacks another man, it can actually enter into the blood. So this is the way by which the plasmodium completes its life cycle in two different organisms.